That's like a radio voice. I, I mean, that's like a good voice. It may, have you ever done any radio or anything? <laughs> sounds, sounds good and official. I'm grateful to be here today. Glad to see you in the Reagan Theater. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about my story. And I'd like to leave some good time for Q&A uh, so that I can try to cater my message to what you're interested in. The whole purpose of me being here is to be helpful to you. That's the only reason I'm here, is if I can help some of you, fantastic. I'd love to do that. So as I go along, feel free to think of questions you'd like to ask me, and I'll, I'll leave 10 or 15 minutes or maybe even more at the end for Q&A, and that can kind of guide our discussion. Until then, though, I'd like to tell you my story, uh, my business story, and about when I was you sitting in these chairs. I was a couple miles east at BYU uh, in 2001, so 13 years ago. And I remember what it was like. I remember how I felt. I remember how I was excited about the opportunities that laid ahead of me, or I hoped lie ahead of me. And I was also nervous about uh, exactly what I should do. So maybe that sounds familiar to some of you. I like stories for two reasons. Number one, uh, when I hear a story that resonates with me, it helps me realize or remember that I'm not alone. I think sometimes we feel like the feelings we are having are unique or different. Often they're not. The most successful business guys that have stood here and lectured you have had the same concerns that you have had, I assume, at one time or another. So that's one reason I like stories. Um, the other reason I like stories is that hopefully from a story you can pull out principles or ideas that apply to your current situation. Um, stories aren't powerful unless there's something applicable that you can kind of turn to your situation. So as I take a couple minutes here to tell you my story, my entrepreneurship story, um, please uh, think about ways that this might be applicable to you because that's the power of stories, when we can apply it to ourselves to make a difference. Um, I've always been an entrepreneur. I love entrepreneurship. In fact, I ran straight here from Centennial Middle School where I just did uh, the career day. I have a, my oldest is a seventh grader, and I just did his career day. So I just had five sessions of entrepreneurship with like 30, seven and eighth graders. And, but what it, re, what it made me remember was how much I love entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurs are about changing the world and hopefully changing the world for good. I love entrepreneurship personally because I have that opportunity every day. And because for me, it's super challenging to be an entrepreneur. It's very difficult, but I love like that challenge uh, to every day be better, to every day innovate and make a difference. It's, it's really energizing for me. And without that challenge, um, I don't know, it just wouldn't be nearly as exciting. So that's personally why I love entrepreneurship. And, being with those kids remem reminded me of that. I, I showed a cool, tank, a cool uh, clip from Shark Tank um, that was focused, you guys have probably heard of Shark Tank, blah, 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 but it was focused on just young kids, 11 to 21 year olds that have pitched Shark Tank. I, I didn't realize how many young, uh, younger kids, again, 11 to 21, have been on Shark Tank pitching those ideas in front of a national audience. <laughs> I showed that clip and it was really cool because those kids are obviously that age. So my story, or at least my bigger story, I've always been an entrepreneur. In high school, uh, actually in junior high, there was a knock on our door and a uh, salesman was at our door selling a carpet cleaning machine. And I remember just kind of hearing it or listening in and I, I asked my parents, Let's buy that, and I'll use it to clean carpets and 
Somehow, after a series of meetings, I don't remember exactly, I convinced them to buy that carpet cleaning machine. And I went out to, we lived across from an elementary school, my elementary school. I grew up in Spokane, Washington. So I went there, I went down the street to a preschool. I went to my dentist and to my doctor. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was like 13 maybe, but I was like locking up good contracts for this carpet cleaning business that I started. And honestly, passed down to kind of my brothers. I have four little brothers. So anyways, but the real interesting part of entrepreneurship started at BYU in 2001. I started a company called Mindwire. It was a technology company. Uh, I had a business partner, a great guy who was a technologist. I was kind of the business guy. We got together and started this business and uh, won the BYU business plan competition in 2001. Is there a business plan competition at UVU? I, we compete at the state, at a state. At a state competition? Cool. Um, and so that was a great experience. We won several competitions in the state of Utah that year. We grew through 9-11, which is obviously was kind of an anomaly and unique for a, um, for a technology company at that time and uh, got some national notoriety for different things and ultimately sold that company to a NASDAQ listed company, a publicly traded company. And it was really funny, and this is a true story. By the way, can I walk wherever or am I messing up the camera? Okay, because I think this is being recorded, which I don't really like, but. Um, so, so here I was, 25 or 26. Do we have any 25 or 26 year olds in the audience about there? Yes, we do. I was negotiating uh, the sale of my business with the CEO of this NASDAQ listed firm that was like a 50 something year old Harvard MBA. And, and I had the audacity or somehow thought that like I could negotiate this purchase contract deal. And I did. I'm not saying that I won uh, necessarily. It was a fine exit for us, a really good exit for a young guy like me. And it got me on my path to kind of where I've gone now. And it was exciting uh, for me. But it's interesting. I, I have not seen the research on this. So hopefully I'm not misquoting. But I've heard a couple of professors at BYU, I guess lecture quite a bit at BYU and do other things. And I've heard them say that there have been studies done, which makes sense, about like what makes entrepreneurs different? You know, like what are the common characteristics of entrepreneurs? And what I've heard is that the research is totally inconclusive. Like there's only one trait um, that sticks out amongst the most successful entrepreneurs. So, I mean, they can be male, female, old, young, Tall, short, unfortunately. What, I mean, you know, they can be totally different ethnic backgrounds, et cetera. Different personalities, super outgoing or not. What do, you, what do you think might be the one trait, the one commonality that they found in successful entrepreneurs? I'm curious. I mean, what? The gift of gab? Oh, man. That's it. It's, they are an overabundance of confidence. The only thing different <laughs> from the standard population across all entrepreneurs is an overabundance of confidence. Like they believe they can change the world. They believe they can do it. And it's, that's interesting. I think that's really interesting. And you could ask my wife and my assistant, uh, that probably suits me. Like I, I feel like I can do whatever. And it's kind of illustrated by that story about negotiating this purchase contract with again, a 50 something Harvard MBA CEO. I was an undergrad from BYU who at the time, I was 25. I was about to turn 26 in a couple months. Um, so anyways, that's a little bit about Mindwire. Um, after Mindwire, I took the proceeds of that exit, which it wasn't that cool of an exit. You probably haven't heard of Mindwire. It was a good little business. We had 20 or 30 employees. Um, we had some IP, we had some talented people, we had some clients that this company was really interested in. So they acquired us. It was a, a cash and stock transaction. Um, the stock part didn't work out as well as I had hoped, but it was an okay exit for a young guy. And I spun the proceeds into real estate. Um, my dad did some real estate growing up in Spokane. It's something I've always been interested in. And I spun the proceeds into real estate, and this is 2003, four, and five, and what was happening in real estate at that time? 
even like dumb guys like me could make a lot of money and everyone was making money in real estate. So I killed it in real estate when I did really nothing special at that time. Um, I rode and turned my money a number of times over those couple of years and was kind of looking for my next gig or big opportunity. I did a couple of other technology startups during that time. They are probably vanished from the face of the earth right now. So I don't want you to think that my path has been just like one step up. A, you know, it hasn't been a perfect straight up. Um, I've had challenges. One of, uh, anyways, I won't tell you the names of the companies. I kind of want to because I want you to like Google it and see if like there's anything there. But anyway, I won't tell you. Um, but so I did, I did several other things. I was doing technology uh, and doing a bunch of real estate. And what I recognized, and it wasn't just me, but I was talking to a bunch of smart people, but what was crazy about the real estate market during that time was the appreciation was just unbelievable. I would literally lock up a piece of land or some, some small project, and before I could even close, I could sell it for like 25% more. After I closed and held it for six to 12 months, I could sell it for like 100% return. It was just completely irrational, and that scared me, frankly. After a time, it really scared me. And so I, in about 2006, sold every real estate um, asset I owned, except one actually, which I still own to this day. Is that a surprise? And it's not a good investment. Um, and kind of huddled up my resources and gathered other resources. And that is like two awesome partners. At Peak Capital Partners, I'm just curious, who's heard of, has anyone heard of Peak Capital Partners? Raise your hand high, because there's only like 10 or 12 of you. Okay, so Peak Capital Partners, I started Peak Capital Partners. Has anyone heard of the village at South Campus or at BYU or the Chillage or the Awful Waffle? Hey, okay, raise your hand if you've heard of that. Oh. Okay, so we own the village. We are the guys behind the village. And we now own like 50 assets like the village around the country. And that was kind of the vision I had was to take advantage. And my partner shared that vision with me. And they're great guys. They were working, they're Ivy League MBAs that were working on the East Coast. I recruited them to kind of come back here and start peak with me. And uh, our thesis was to, one, take advantage of the dislocation in the real estate market and values and buy distressed assets. And we've done that. Um, the land that the village sits on was a bankrupt piece of land that we bought out of bankruptcy, for instance. We owned a local ski resort here in Utah uh, until about six or eight months ago that was a distressed opportunistic buy. So that was one part of our strategy. The second part was to focus on apartments, and that was for two main reasons. One, my two partners, Jeff and Jamie, were good at apartments. That's what their background and experience was in. And two, the three of us agreed that the best risk-adjusted returns uh, would be found within uh, the real estate, within multifamily assets for the next several years. And there are several reasons for that. So here's the village, right? You've seen that picture, hopefully. That's the closest asset that we own here to UVU. So I'm using it as an example, and hopefully some of you guys have been there. Um, so we bought a bunch of real estate, and we have we're now launching, uh, we also do some venture investing on the side called Peak Ventures, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Peak Capital Partners. We formed up in late 2006, and in the last six or seven years, we own 64 multifamily properties, nearly 10,000 units. The asset value is about $650 million. Our goal in 2014 is to grow that to a billion dollar in asset value, <laughs> mainly in multifamily real estate. We're passionate about providing clean, nice, affordable housing to families across the United States, and we own in a bunch of markets. Here they are. And you, the blue are the market, or kind of the states that we're in and own assets in. And so we started with kind of an inner mountain west focus, but have spread out kind of from there. 
The interesting thing about multifamily assets, there are several interesting components. Obviously, debt rates have been really low, which is interesting. And I guess I'm trying to illustrate here what I think is a, I hope this story illustrates for you a key component and maybe differentiator of a successful entrepreneur. And that is being opportunistic, right? And being a contrarian. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but not necessarily going with the flow. When people were scared to death about real estate, I wanted to buy as much real estate as I could. Uh, when people didn't like technology, I mean, that's about when I started my technology business. There's power in being a contrarian to kind of common sentiment and creating something that isn't thought of right then or now. And uh, I, I think there's power in that idea and also the idea of being opportunistic. Interest rates have been really low, right? It's a good time to buy multifamily assets. We personally, I personally am concerned about inflation. Um, Real estate acts as a great, hedge, a, a, a great hedge against inflation, multifamily assets. How is that? Business people, how would that be? Why is it a great hedge against inflation? Number one, it's a real solid, tangible asset, right? It's not paper or whatever. It's, you can go to the village right now and see it, and there's materials there and work there that's been done that has some value at least, right? But this, the most powerful way that it's a hedge is that, so we, we house about 10,000 families, and, so, and we do year-long contracts. Every month, about 10% of our portfolio is repricing, right? We're repricing in our portfolio every month. So 1,000 families, roughly, in our portfolio every month, their contract is running out. And we then have the opportunity to say, You've been paying $750 because of inflation. I'm not saying we'd say this exactly, but because inflation, prices have risen. The rent is now $800. And if they want to pay that, fantastic. If not, that's fine. We wish them well, but we'll find someone else to pay the market rate. Does that make sense? So we believe at Peak Capital Partners that multifamily assets are a great hedge in an inflationary environment, which we're not really seeing now, but we fear is on the horizon, right? So there's some of the thesis or thoughts around peak capital partners. Hopefully, hopefully that's interesting. By the way, feel free to follow me on Twitter if you'd like, and feel free to tweet um, out during, this, during my speech if you'd like to create a little uh, conversation about entrepreneurship if you're interested, or if there's something that I say that resonates with you. What I'm passionate, for me, the real estate uh, investment was, was opportunistic. It was, again, where I felt like the best risk-adjusted returns would be found for the next decade. This is in 2006 or seven. I love real estate. I've grown to love it. I'm passionate about it. We have a team now of about 100 people uh, that manage our real estate portfolio. They're great and they're passionate about it. What I seriously love though and what I cannot get away from and I'm afraid I won't be able to get away from it ever or at least until I retire or I, I don't know die I'm not sure when is I love seed stage venture investing I mean I love early stage startups that's what I feel like I'm best at um, that's what I really love so that leads us to peak ventures kind of the last thing I want to tell you about in my story um, Peak Capital is kind of known for real estate, definitely within the state. Um, we've invested about 200 million in equity, like cash. That's both my and my partner's money as well as LP money or limited partner investor money in real estate. But what we've also been doing a lot more quietly on the side is we've been doing these kind of seed stage venture investments. Uh, and we've been doing this between just me and my two partners for the last three or four years. And we've had some pretty good success. I'm in the process right now of working really hard to uh, provide some kind of uh, structure around our Peak Ventures platform and strategy. But right now it's kind of been onesie twosie deals on the side. And we've done about 15 of these kind of deals. I'll be curious to hear if you guys have heard of any of these. A lot of these are locals 
stage startups. And a lot of these investments have been made in the last six months or 18 months. But we've done investments in a cool company called Fire Avert. And this is one of our focuses in Peak Ventures. We're interested in technologies or businesses that we can incubate in our kind of laboratory of apartment assets. Does that make sense? We own 10,000 apartment units. That's a really interesting laboratory to place small bets in, to learn things from, to pivot or iterate, change, to try to nail the pain within our own kind of real estate portfolio. This is a win-win. It's a win for our real estate portfolio. Hopefully, we're because we're nailing a pain and solving a problem that we've seen. So we're nailing the pain within our portfolio, and then we're scaling it outside of it. Fire Avert's a good example of this. Fire Avert simply is a technology that cuts power to stoves to stop fires. It was the founder was a fireman, a local fireman. He kept getting uh, he kept getting called out to like kitchen fires, mostly in apartment complexes. And he thought, gosh, there's got to be a better way than to, to like stop the fire. Um, and so he created this technology. It's, it's called Fire Avert. And what it does is it listens for the fire alarm. And as soon as it hears the fire alarm, it cuts off the power to the stove. Interesting company. And you see how that could be valuable in, in the real estate side? We have, and I don't know exactly, but we have a couple kitchen fires in our portfolio every quarter. <laughs> when you own 10,000 assets, things happen, and I can tell you a lot of interesting, when you're housing 10,000 families, there's a lot of interesting stories that come out of owning housing for 10,000 families, if you can only imagine. And so there are some fires that cause damage to our assets and are a little bit traumatizing to the tenant. And so if we can obviously stop that, that'd be fantastic. There's an example. Again, I, I'm, I'm running through. Please you know, think of questions, because I, I want to get to Q&A pretty quick here, because I want this to be valuable for you. Has anyone heard of Studio? If not, please go to your, oh, has anyone heard of Studio? Yeah, can we have a raise of hands? It looks like there's like three or four people. More people have heard of Peak Capital Partners. That's good, I guess. Although, we're the lead investor in Studio, so I wish you heard of Studio as well. Uh, pull out your iPhones if you want. Go to the App Store and look at Studio Design. It's a really cool overlay uh, design technology for pictures. This is a company that came out of Boom Startup. It's not. That's okay. Um, has anyone heard of Boom Startup? Wow. So Boom Startup is the like premier local accelerator in this area. Do you know what an accelerator is? Have you heard of Y Combinator or Techstars? It's basically bringing in young companies with, with giving them a little capital and surrounding them with mentors to help them be successful. Boom Startup is accept, accepting applications, this, so look it up, for this summer's class, which will be 2014. It's housed, at least here locally, it's housed in the Camp 4 building near downtown Provo. Uh, it's a really cool program, and I've been involved with Boom Startup for a while. Studio was a company that went through the uh, Boom Startup program, and that Peak Ventures became the lead investor of uh, eight months ago or so. Some really cool co-investors in this company. Um, uh, Ron Conway with SV Angel, if you've heard of these names. Uh, Michael Arrington, the founder of TechCrunch. And then Ashton Kucher uh, is a co-investor with us in this deal. It's a really cool deal. Check it out. Nothing to do with apartments, right? But cool early stage seed company. The CEO and team are great, great guys. Good local group that we're excited to back and try to help. Most of these companies I sit on the board with and I meet that with them. We don't just give them capital and say, good luck. We give them capital and then we sweat or spend as much time as we possibly can with them to help their business be successful. Toot Genomics, another super cool, interesting company. It's uh, the human, it's a SaaS model, software as a service model for the human genome. Check it out. Really cool. Another company, Screeny, HR software. Uh, Blue Roof 360. This is another uh, business. It's a tech startup, but uh, 
It's a business that's tied to the real estate. It's a suite of base, it, it's tied to real estate. It's a suite of tools that basically allows, empowers agents and brokers to be as effective as possible. So there's an app and several other tools. Uh, we like the team there a lot. And then a company called CitySpark, which is event aggregation, et cetera. So to, to wrap up here and to kind of go to Q&A, we end at 12.20, right, Dean? OK. To wrap up here and to go to, to Q&A, you can ask me about MindWire, about um, Peak Capital Partners, about the village, about Peak Ventures, about life, whatever you want to. I'll try to be as open and honest as I can be and try to help out as much as I can. But to wrap up, I just have a couple of ideas, some final thoughts that I'd like to leave with you. These are four kind of practices or things that I have found uh, have made, helped me be successful and have mattered a lot to me. And I think they're good just kind of general principles of advice for business people and especially for entrepreneurs. Number one, compete to be the best in whatever you do. I, was, I actually uh, had a short stint playing college uh, basketball and I'm, a, I'm five foot eight, so I'm a short point guard. But I, love, I grew up, I was a quarterback in high school. I love sports, I love football, I love basketball. I think that a lot of that competition aspect can apply to business. Um, no matter what you do, whether it's being an entrepreneur, a teacher, an executive at a big company, I don't care what it is, mm -hmm. your personal goal should be to be the best and compete every day to be the best at whatever you do. It doesn't matter. I I've actually found that as I've gotten a little bit older, I'm 36 years old now, as I've gotten a little bit older, um, I actually care maybe a little bit less about my exact specific thing I'm doing. I bet you in your minds right now, you're thinking a lot about the specific thing you're gonna do, right? Like your path, what is my exact path? What am I gonna do? I find as I get older, I care a little bit less about that and more just about being great at whatever I do. That's what matters to me, being the best, the best I can be at whatever I do. So don't worry so much about your specific path would be my advice. Worry about competing to be the best in whatever you do. And if you have that competition mentality, if you work at it, you'll be successful at whatever I think you choose to do. Most importantly, obviously, whatever you do, do it with integrity. Uh, no, ma no, no amount of money that you can make uh, matters if you don't do it the right way. Burned bridges. I was a little bit more, so do it with integrity and I maybe say be kind, you know? I mean, I was pretty, I was a, too harsh and blunt early in my career when I was your age. I was too just, so no, no hurt relationships will be worth whatever you make or whatever you do. Make sure you do whatever you do with integrity. This is the third point, like I said, be a contrarian. Do you guys understand what I mean when I say that? Are there any questions? I mean, or do you get that? Like, go against the flow. Don't, like, everyone's building an app right now, right? Everyone. I mean, our investment in studio is super exciting, but it's also super risky. Uh, most apps don't make it. We understand that. And I'm not discouraging if you have a great app idea, but just realize where trends are headed. Don't follow the herd. Be your own person and be a contrarian. Again, a lot of the success I feel like I've had is being able to pull away from the herd mentality or from what everyone else is doing and taking a breath and thinking and saying, how can I be successful with what I think is coming? What, what do I think is coming and how can I, how can I be opportunistic in that space? Uh, I would, you know, don't be afraid to go against the grain. And the last thing is just persevere. Look, again, and I mean this sincerely, I believe it, there's a lot of luck in business. Um, if there's one thing that's not luck, it's that the guys that have been successful, in my opinion, have been the ones that have stuck it out. They don't give up when times get hard. Uh, I mean, peak capital and peak ventures right now is still a roller coaster. I have great days. You can ask my wife. I have great days where I come home super energized and excited. I have days like last night when I got home at 9 or 10 p.m. and I'm, super, I'm just kind of bummed. It's just hard. It's hard work. Like 
it's not completely linear. It's more iterative. It's more movement and pivoting and changing. So if you, don't be discouraged if you have two steps, back, two steps forward and a step back. Three steps forward, a step back. One step forward, two steps back. I mean, be aware of what's happening. Uh, just don't give up. Persevere. I, think, I, think that's, I know that's super soft, but I think it's really, really important. And if there was something that I could put my finger on to the people who have succeeded and those who haven't, it might just be they just stick with it. They just do not give up. They just don't go away. So, questions? It's 12.08. I think we have 12 minutes. I'll try to answer the questions the best I can and be as helpful as possible. Go ahead. That's cool. That's entrepreneurship in action, right? You saw an opportunity. I always tell entrepreneurs, and I'm so surprised. In fact, I sent out a tweet like a couple weeks ago, like late at night, I think, because I was just surprised and bummed, really. I said something like, why are people so risk averse? Because I just don't get it. Um, the mirror image of risk is what? Opportunity, right? Without risk, there is no opportunity. How boring would life be if there was no risk? I mean, there'd be no opportunity. It would be terrible. I, I would hate it. I mean, the mirror image of risk is opportunity. No risk, no opportunity. Remember that. So I love your story. I'm not, I don't know about precious metals. I'm not an advisor. What I do like are hard assets. Um, uh, and I, I think alternative assets like that are potentially interesting. But I don't have expertise. I'm not an advisor. And I'm not recommending anything. Uh, but. So I love that. You took data, overlaid it, and applied it, right? Sweet. Keep doing that. Take data. Make small bets. Again, this is, if anything, what's cool about entrepreneurship right now, I mean, I'm so excited about entrepreneurship in Utah right now. Unbelievable things that are happening. We own a building right across from Vivint in the Riverwoods. So it's Ancestry, Vivint, Qualtrics. We're right across. I mean, that's a cool road. I mean, there's a lot of cool things like going on. And by the way, throw Peak Capital into the mix of that cool road. That's, that's what makes it super cool, in my opinion. But um, I am so excited about the opportunities for entrepreneurship in Utah. It's unbelievable. And here's my global point. Being an, it's never been so cheap to be an entrepreneur. Why? With technology, you can take little bets, take little steps, learn and pivot. You know what I mean? It's, it's super cool to kind of practice entrepreneurship. And you can do it without taking down the house, right? Without burning the bridges. Sometimes that's called for, sometimes that happens, but you don't need to do that. As, as college students, you need to practice, learn, pivot. Anyways, I like that. Other questions? In the blue. Um, so at the beginning, you mentioned uh, most I provide for my family. Can I be an entrepreneur? Can I do this? Am I really cut out to do this? Um, is this a legitimate path? Almost kind of what I thought. That, that's, it's, it would be hard. Two things that you guys might not have an appreciation for that are really different. It's only been a decade, 10 years or so. But, and the dean would probably agree with this. I mean, like, entrepreneurship's super cool now. It's super, it didn't used to be nearly as cool. When I first started, 
Entrepreneurship was kind of like, oh, you can't find a job. And this is maybe what my in-laws thought. Sorry. You can't find a job, so you're going to be an entrepreneur. Oh, good luck with that, you know. Um, uh, the other thing that I was going to say was the ecosystem, the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem is so much ro more robust here in Utah than it's ever been. Unbelievable difference. The opportunities that you guys have and the infrastructure and support you guys could have than when I first started is so much better, so much more. But the questions I had, I think the questions that you have, like what should I do with my life? Can I do this? Is this a good opportunity? Can I provide for my family? Um, and I mean the first, in MindWire, I, we started it in like August, August, I can't, I can't remember the year exactly, so I'm not going to say, I don't want to remember, but August, and we, my partner and I, I graduated in April of 2001, so it was August of 2000, April of 2001, I graduated from BYU, and we, by that time, we had 10 to 15 employees, all paying them, of course, but my partner and I had not taken a penny out of the business. Our first kind of paycheck came in May, the month, I mean, that's just serendipitous, that's the truth. So I went without nine months without making any money. Same thing with Peak Capital. Uh, there were a number of years where my partners and I took nothing out of the business. So uh, you got to plant seeds and they take a while to harvest sometimes. Anyways, does that answer your question? That was kind of rambling. But same, I think you have similar questions. Did you have a question? Uh, the only new construction we've ever done is the village. We don't really consider ourselves developers. We're owners, so this goes to answer your first mm -hmm. question. We own assets, and about six months ago, we felt like we had enough scale and expertise, we hired some good people, to start our own property management company. It's called Peak Living. Uh, but so until then, we had outsourced all our property management. We were just the owners. Now, we are now also property managers, but we, you know, we're rolling it out. Over six months, we probably manage 20% uh, of our assets. And we have third-party managers manage 80% of them. Does that make sense? Problem, right and even retiring early is not a problem so I've always been a saver um, I've always been a planner my wife and I have always had a budget um, but yeah there were years at the beginning when we didn't really have insurance it was you know that's the risk opportunity we didn't really have insurance or definitely didn't have good insurance there were at the beginning we didn't have retirement all the money we had was basically plowed back into the business but um, those things will come into focus as you start to have a measure of success. But at the start, I'm not, there's not a good answer for those concerns at the start. I think the point is that's part of the risk and opportunity metric that you have to go through in your head and be comfortable with. I'm not aware of a good answer or solution. Was there a question back here? Yeah. one or the team absolutely I mean one of the kids one of the one of my son's friends remember I was at career day before this one of my son's friends said taco chopper have you guys heard of this he claims that there's a business kind of like the Amazon drones that is delivering tacos like to your doorstep like dropping them off like this is someone's business plan that's what he claims like you just open your mouth and tacos fall from the sky into your mouth it's like unbelievable it sounds good to me but um, the point is, I, I don't know if that's a very good business idea. So if you were the smartest, greatest guy, and you, if the business idea is terrible, I'm, I'm not going to invest in Taco Chopper probably no matter who brings that to me. But 
uh, if, if I have real confidence in the team and in the person, that matters a lot. I was in a meeting like two months ago. Danielle, my assistant, was in there with me. And like we walked out of the meeting, I immediately said to her, I don't love the idea, but I love that entrepreneur. Like he just has the grit to make it happen. I just believe he will make something happen. Because the funny thing is with a business plan, and this is changing from business plan to business model. Do you guys under, like when I was doing this uh, 13 years ago, it was the business plan competition. A plan is something you write down, you make it look good and say, we're going to do this. And unfortunately, a lot of it's not, you don't know. How can you write a plan about something you don't know about? Now it's about a business model. Here's our thesis. Here's our validation. Here's how we validated it. Here what, here's what we believe the pain is and how we can serve that pain. And, and so the point is there's kind of been a shift in thinking. There's been a realization that no entrepreneur or like maybe 0.1% know their idea day one. So you need to invest in the right person because it's going to change, you know? It's not, the, the plan that they put out before you is not going to stay the same. It's not static. It's constantly changing. So you need the person that can stick with the, that can, that can pivot with the plan, can change effectively. Anyway, sorry. So the team's really super important, most important thing. But if it's a terrible idea, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest in Mark Cuban with Taco Chopper, probably, or whatever, you know, whatever, whoever you want to choose. <laughs> Um, one last question, are we done? One more question. In the hat. What's one, uh... Question. Um, have you guys heard of SCAN, Garrett G? Have you guys heard of, uh, I'm going to give you a couple. SCAN with Garrett G, he was on Shark Tank. He was in our office for a little bit of time before he, he raised money from Google Ventures and other people. We just we were so busy building our real estate, we weren't really ready to invest in a tech startup. That's one we missed. I'm bummed about a little bit. Another one is D Daniel Blake. Have you heard of Eco Scraps? Similar story. Eco Scraps was in our basement of our building for a time, and again, we just weren't mobilized and ready to and pull the trigger. But I really like Dan. I like Eco Scraps. And then one more. Have you heard of Space Monkey? I like the Space Monkey guys. It's a cloud storage device. It's here. It's in Salt Lake. That's another business that was kind of with us for a time. And these are the last several years, local businesses that we missed on that, that I believe in. I think we'll do really well. I wish we would have uh, done them. There's three of them. Well, thank you again for yep. coming. And this is a small token of our appreciation for speaking to our students. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You.